thank you very thank you very much chris for agreeing to give a build a cell seminar and you can get started thanks kate really do appreciate the invitation um just a little bit of introduction about myself i'm chris alabi i'm an associate professor uh in the smith school of chemical and biomolecular engineering uh, at cornell i started here about 11 years ago uh and prior to my position at Cornell, I was a postdoc at MIT with uh, Bob Binder and Dan Anderson. And then prior to that, uh, I did my PhD with, with Mark Davis at Caltech. And I'm generally interested in, in, in the topic that I'm gonna be talking about today, though this topic I think is fairly new for our lab, uh, which is on the delivery of proteins uh, by what we call this bioreversible anionic cloaking. But in general, my lab is interested in the, in the delivery of uh, biologics. And so, uh, with that, I will I will get started. And so I always like to get started with this slide, uh, which is when you think about drugging some sort of a protein or at least some sort of modality, say you have this protein here, this is a <clears throat> dihydrofolate reductase. Uh, we often think of using some sort of a small molecule. And the reason for that is in order to be able to drug this protein target, we need some sort of a well-defined binding site something that we can hook onto, especially if the protein is an enzyme, and this is the enzyme's active site, of course, if you deliver it substrate or something that looks like a substrate to block that site, you can inhibit um, the activity of that protein. And so this is great for proteins that have these well-defined binding pockets. Um, in order to be able to do this, you need to wage some sort of a small molecule discovery campaign to discover these small molecules, of which there are a lot of now. Um, this operates by what we call the site occupancy effect, which is you need um, to occupy the site in order to have an inhibitory effect. Once your drug is um, removed from that site, uh, the protein can be active again. And so typically what we have is this one molecule, one target effect. Um, however, there, there are many proteins that fall outside of this sort of neat and tidy uh, definition that I just gave you. Uh, and so there are many proteins that fall into this difficult to drug proteome. And these are likely proteins, for example, scaffolding proteins or membrane proteins or other proteins that don't have a well-defined binding site. Perhaps they're not enzymes, they're more signaling molecules. Um, and so take the example I've just shown here, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase uh, that really doesn't have a well-defined binding pocket, but has more of a shallow surface, um, similar to, to, to the structure on its right. Uh, this SIAH, which is essentially it's an E3 ubiquitin ligase, it actually has a narrow groove through it. Um, so it can't easily accommodate a small molecule, but can accommodate things like peptides. And so this difficult to drug proteome are, are better drugs with, with modalities that have a large surface area. And so things that, that can span the large surface area of these proteins. So for example, proteins or peptides. And so again, these are advantageous for these types of, um, of protein modalities. The advantage of using proteins or peptides is that, you know, these, these, these proteins can be rapidly designed against any target of interest or peptides by a variety of protein engineering techniques or display technologies. So yeast displays, age displays, mRNA display, for example. Um, and so they're advantageous from that point of view, but the issue uh, with these large biologics is that they have poor cell permeability. Um, and when it comes to things like peptides, actually rather poor stability in serum. And so this is what my lab, my lab I would say, this is what we're largely interested in. We're, we're interested in these barriers that phase the delivery of macromolecules. And by macromolecules, I mainly mean proteins, peptides, RNAs, for example. And so we're interested in the delivery of these biologics into cells via um, a range of, of of delivery system modalities. And I'll talk about one in particular today, and that will be... Um, using nanoparticles to deliver um, proteins into cells, though we do have quite a bit of work uh, on the delivery of, of peptide-based degraders and also on the delivery of messenger RNA as well. Um, and so if you think about protein therapeutics, um, you know, this is an exploding market, I would say. In fact, this slide is a little bit dated uh, by now, uh, but there's rapid growth in this, in this market, but these are mainly designed, in fact, all the protein therapeutics in the market right now are mainly designed um, against extracellular targets. And the reason for that um, is that you just can't get these proteins into cells as full length proteins. Um, but there are a lot of advantages and there are a lot of targets that could be, uh, that could see benefit from being able to transport 
um, a full length protein into a cell in order to be able to inhibit some sort of an intracellular target. And so when it comes to delivering proteins, you might think, well, we have modalities such as messenger RNAs that can be delivered into cells in order to be able to express uh, a certain protein of interest. Um, but why are we interested in delivering the intact protein itself? Well, I'll say that there are a number of reasons or at least a number of indications why you might want to deliver the intact protein uh, in self. One is actually a cost perspective. If you really think about it, messenger RNAs are quite expensive. There are a lot of proteins that can be easily expressed. Um, and beneficial for delivery. Uh, there are cases where you could have maladaptive translation, for example, in some viral indications and viral diseases. And so if the virus hijacks your translational apparatus, uh, can't really use a messenger RNA to express that protein. Um, other examples of the need for rapid and controlled dosage, which you can do by direct protein delivery, a little bit more difficult to do with messenger RNA delivery. Of course, if you're delivering a protein with a post-translational modification that is non-natural, of course, you can't use the genetic code to express that. Uh, and something that is big for us that I'll show you some data on is the direct delivery of off-the-shelf antibodies. And so similar to how you could essentially take a small molecule off the shelf to inhibit some sort of um, signaling um, um, pathway in a cell in order to be able to understand a mechanism of action, could you now do the same thing with an off-the-shelf antibody rather than with a small molecule, given that the off-the-shelf antibody would be more specific? And so we're really interested in in some of these um, um, properties that direct protein delivery gives us. Um, and then all of this taken together, uh, some recent studies have also shown that actually your global proteome response to an mRNA versus a protein is actually quite different. And this is recent work that came out of, of, of the Sorkis lab. And so for all these reasons, we're, we're really interested in, you know, are there ways to deliver the, uh, the intact protein into a cell? And the strategy that we took was actually to leverage the current um, lipid nanoparticle technology that has been shown to be effective for delivery of a wide range of nucleic acids of which messenger RNAs are one of. And so rather than redesign the container, the vesicle, I would say, we decided to re-engineer the protein or surface engineer the protein in order to be able like a messenger RNA so that we can actually deliver it into cells. And so this work was mainly championed by a student in my lab called Asmine, shown in the top right here. Uh, and the idea here was actually quite simple. Can we take proteins and make them super anionic and make them look like nucleic acids so that we can essentially stuff them into lipid nanoparticles and deliver them to cells? And so in order to do that, we designed this anionic cloak. And this is what's shown on your top uh, left-hand side of your screen. And it has three key, key features. The first feature, of course, is this, is this uh, anionic sulfonate group. Uh, that you can see in that in that pink color. And so this is where your anionic cloak or your anionic feature comes out. And each molecule that is modified with an, to an amino acid and your protein uh, displays four of these molecules. So it's, it's sort of dendritic in nature. The second feature is the activated carbonate for lysine conjugation uh, on your left, which is shown in green. And what this does is it allows us to hook this cloak onto any lysine residue on the surface of the protein. Now, all proteins have some sort of lysines on them, uh, and so we're guaranteed to be able to modify any protein with this. And so as we modify one lysine, we essentially take out one positive charge and we replace it with four negative charges. And then the third feature here is this redox cleavable disulfide bond shown in the middle in blue. And what this allows is for this cloak to essentially come off uh, in the cytosol because the cytosol is a reducing environment. And once that comes off in the cytosol, as you can see on top right with GSH, it allows for self-immolative release of the, of the section of the linker that is still left to give you back your protein in its native form. And so essentially the cloak completely disappears once it gets into, into the cytoplasm. And so that's a general idea is that we can take this, this, this probe, we can modify any protein with it, uh, use it to encapsulate into lipid nanoparticles, which can then deliver the protein in, in its in its intact form into cells um, and then release the protein in its active form. And uh, you know, there's a lot more data that I'm not gonna be able to show today. And so if you're really interested in this topic, um, there's a link there to a publication that was just published on all of this work um, just a few months ago. Okay, so let's get right to it. So how do we do this? So we made, we initially made three different probes. Um, you know, the probe that I would largely talk about today is SL4, the one shown on your right, uh, but that has four negative charges on it. We made two of the probes that had two negative charges on it to, 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 to 
investigate the influence of anionic density on performance. And here we're using um, GFP essentially as a model protein. It's a 27 kilodalton protein. And what I'm what, what I'm showing on on uh, the gel on this slide is essentially just a, a polyacrylamide gel that shows that as you modify with these probes, uh, your protein essentially becomes more anionic. So you can see your proteins are migrating from the negative to the positive electrode, which is at the bottom of the gel. And so as you increase the amount of anionic cloaking uh, that you're making onto GFP, you see more anionic proteins. If you add glutathione to that, which is GSH. The concentration is reflective of what might be uh, what might be the intracellular concentration. Uh, you see that you can actually regain your protein back to where it is, as you can see SFGFP is there on the left of your gel. Uh, and what we see here is that SL4 uh, seems to perform the best in terms of recovery of the protein back to its native form. And then we can also run um, a MALDI on, on, on the modified proteins. And we see that on average, we have anywhere between three to five, an average of about four or five of these cloaks on the surface of our protein. And so four or five essentially corresponds to about 16 to 20 negative charges um, on the surface of GFP after modification. Um, and so the first test is now we know that we can modify, it's characterized it by gel, we've characterized it by MALDI, we can also characterize it by another technique called isoelectric point focusing, IEF, to calculate the isoelectric point of the protein, which is the PI of that protein. And as you can see, the PI of, of GFP is somewhere around 5.5, it's actually closer to six. And we see that as we modify with the anionic probe, uh, the, the isoelectric point drops to below 4.7. Um, and so again, it becomes anionic, we can then take these, and the first test was just to evaluate delivery using a commercial delivery reagent, which I think a lot of people per perhaps have, have used in the past for delivery of plasmids into cells, and it's just called lipopectin 2000. Um, and so the idea is, given that you can transfect DNA, RNA um, with, with this lipopectin reagent, now that we've anionically cloaked our proteins, can we do the same thing? For, for protein delivery? And the answer was yes. Um, across the board, across all of our pros from SL2 to SL4, we see that as we increase the amount of cloaking uh, that we perform on our, on our SFGFD protein, we actually increase the percent of cells that were transfected. But again, this is all topping out with lipofectamine at about 30% transfection or so. And so we're really interested in taking this further and rather than using this commercial reagent lipofectamine, we're really interested in using um, lipid nanoparticles that, again, I've, like, like I said before, are clinically validated for the delivery of, of RNAs. Um, and the way these work is you have a four-component lipid formulation that contains uh, a peg lipid for steric shielding, DSPC or DOPE really for an isomal fusion and escape, cholesterol to stabilize the particle, and MC3 is an ionizable lipid that is responsible for actually complexing. Um, it is also responsible for, for, for endosomal escape as well. And the key here is that we typically formulate at a pH that is lower than the pKa of the ionizable lipid. And so the ionizable lipid here, MC3, has a pKa of roughly 6.5 or so. And so we typically drop the pH to 4 or 3 in order to protonate the ionizable lipid. Um, and by doing this, we have to make sure or ensure that the anionic feature is still anionic at this low pH. And this was the primary reason for using the sulfonates because again, their pKa is well below two, and so at pH of three, they're still anionic. We then undergo rapid mixing, the lipids are in ethanol, the proteins are in aqueous rapid mixing, and then rapid dialysis to give us a lipid nanoparticle. However, what we wanted to be able to take a look here was, you know, I mentioned two things that you might, you might have heard of, and you might think these are anathema to proteins, which are low pH <laughs> and ethanol, although the ethanol is in the lipid phase, the lipids are in the ethanol, but we rapidly mix them. And it's a three to one ratio of the acres to the organic rapidly mixed in and rapid dialysis. But we wanted to take a look and ensure that the proteins were stable to these formulation conditions. And as you might imagine, um, using a pH of three is not conducive to proteins. And so here we're just looking at uh, just seeing protein recovery after treating to see if we can actually see these proteins on the gel at all. And we see that the pH three with or without the 25% ethanol in that solution for the rapid mixing um, the protein is essentially gone. Uh, we can do the same thing by taking a look at the fluorescence of GFP, completely drops the pH 3, uh, but we can see it recovers the pH 5 and pH 7.4.
Um, interestingly enough, actually, with or without the, the small bits of ethanol for the rapid mixing, doesn't really affect the protein uh, fluorescence structure and behavior that much, but really it's the low pH uh, that was killing the protein in this case. And so what we saw was, okay, so now that we're limited to a pH of 5 or 7.4, what does the encapsulation efficiency look like at these low pHs? And we saw that even at pH 5 and 7.4, we're at really low encapsulation efficiency, somewhere around 20%, right? And so even though we're encapsulating our protein, the problem here is that the ionizable lipid, where the pH is near the pKa of the ionizable lipid, and so we don't seem to have sufficient charge for encapsulation. And so to be able to supplement that, uh, to ensure that we can encapsulate, we introduce a fifth lipid, which is called DOTAP. DOTAP is a permanently cationic lipid, um, but we only need to add this lipid in about 10% of the entire formulation. Um, the MC3 is present in about 50%, so that's still the primary component of the formulation. Uh, and by doing this, we're able to rescue the encapsulation efficiencies such that at pH 5, uh, we're able to rise to about 70%. Uh, encapsulation efficiencies, which is, again, the amount of protein that we add relative to the amount of protein that is actually in the particle. Uh, a pH 7.4, we're somewhere between 40 and 50, 50% 50 encapsulation efficiencies, which we think is, um, which we think is acceptable. Okay. And so moving on from here, we then decided to size these particles with and without DOTAP. We see these particles are somewhere in the two to 300 nanometer range. We see the zeta potential, even with the addition of the 10% dota, because again, we're, we're achieving complexation here. Zeta potential, which is the surface charge on these particles, is essentially near zero. So these are not cationic by any stretch of the imagination. Again, the surface potentials are near zero, and, and we're still able to maintain decent encapsulation efficiencies, both at a pH of 5 and 7.4. And so the true test is, okay, can we actually deliver these proteins into cells? And so what I'm showing you as a start uh, are just flow cytometry results. If you're not used, used to looking at flow cytometry, this is a histogram that essentially shows you the distribution of cells and on the X axis is the fluorescence. And so the more you shift to your right, the more uptake you have in your cells. And so what we see here is in the first sort of block I have on the left, you see cells alone, you see SFGFT alone, obviously that doesn't get into cells. And so you don't see any shift in that histogram. Lipofectamine with SFGFT, no shift. The LMP with just SFGFP that is not ion anionically cloaked also shows you no effect, right? And then you move to the next figure uh, on the right in the middle there, shows you again, even with the cloaked SFGFP without a, a delivery vehicle, you really don't see much change in terms of the shift. Uh, but of course, with lipofectamine, you can see a gradual shift to the left. You can see an additional population with high fluorescence. Uh, and of course, with the lipid nanoparticle, you see a complete shift in that in that histogram showing you that pretty much all your cells are transfected. And so we can quantify this by looking at the percent cells transfected, and we can do this with a wide variety of, of ionizable lipids. Um, ALC and SM are essentially the principal ionizable lipid in the Pfizer and in the Moderna formulation. And so we use that as well, just for a proof of concept. And we see that across the board, uh, once we add just a little bit of dota to all of those formulations that are about 10%, uh, we see greater than 80%, um, 80, greater than 70 to 80% uh, of our cells are transfected. And so this was certainly positive, showing that with us anionic cloak and the lipid nanoparticles, we can actually facilitate protein GFB delivery into cells. Uh, but not only can we do this, you know, all the data I'm showing you here are over 250 nanomolar of your GFP that was added in your particle. Um, but we can drop this all the way down to even about 10 nanomole and we still see robust transfection um, into cells. So very, very little change in cell viability. In fact, with the LMPs, we really don't see a change in cell viability. Uh, the reduction in cell viability that you see with lipofectamine is due to the lipofectamine because lipofectamine itself is, is slightly toxic. Um, of course, we wanted to be able to compare this to um, other anionic um, groups. And so again, we chose the sulfonates because we knew we would be formulating at either pH 3 or pH 5, which are again, low pHs. Uh, and again, at pH 5, if you use something like a carboxylate, the problem with carboxylates is their pKa is at a pH, is, a, is, is about 5. And so they wouldn't be fully anionic at that pH. Nonetheless, we gave this a try. And so rather than the sulfonates, we made the exact same cloak over the carboxylate instead. Again, we see that as we modify, as we increase the amount that we modify with, we drop the PI of that protein. And if we add DTT to it in the gel above, we can recover the protein, which is good. 
Um, but we see that with the carboxylates, even with the addition of 10% DOTAP, uh, we're really plateauing at an encapsulation efficiency of only about 30% relative to the 60% that we got for the sulfonates. So certainly using the sulfonates seems to be better. Nonetheless, with these uh, carboxylate probes, which we call CL4, with the LMPs, we still see delivery into cells, just not as robust as we see with the sulfonates. Uh, and so I'm plotting that quantified data here. And so you can see with 10% DOTAP, um, SFGFP with CL4, which is the carboxylate, still enable delivery into your cells at 215 nanomolar, uh, but the uh, sulfonates SL4 are superior to the carboxylates. Okay, so this is good. We know we can transfect cells. We know we can do it with our SL4 sulfonate probes, which seem to be, again, superior to the carboxylate probes at both pHs, at both pH uh, 5 and 7.4, in terms of those are your formulation pHs. Um, again, seeing is believing, <laughs> showing you a lot of flow cytometry data, but we also see this if we just look at the cells by confocal microscopy. And so that's what I'm showing to you on the right. Um, cells alone, of course, in your GFP channel, you don't really see much or SFGFP alone. But in the presence of the SL4, again, you're able to see robust transfection into your cells, showing the green signals. The blue is just a host dye to show you the nuclei of the cells. Uh, with CL4, as we said, you still get some transfection when you cloak it with the carboxylates. Um, but again, as, as seen in those confocal images, uh, just not as robust as what you see with the, with the sulfonate charges. All right. Um, we then did some um, subcellular localization studies uh, just to see where these things are going. Again, they seem to be within the cell. We think that these are going into the cytoplasm, but we don't really have proof of that. And I'll show you some more proof of that a little bit later. Uh, but here, just taking a look at host staining in blue, uh, the next channel is like GFP. And you know the, the GFP seems to be in these punctate vesicular structures. And we see the same thing if we if we perform studies with say um, a, a lipid nanoparticle with with an RNA inside of it, and so if you take a lipid nanoparticle and you encapsulate um, a short interferon RNA with a fluorophore on it, you see almost the same type of distribution. You see like this punctate features. Yet the siRNA seem to escape are in the cytosol and, and can give you knockdown. Uh, we decided to over, overlay this with lysoview, which stains just lysotracker essentially stains the lysosome to see if we're trapping these things in the lysosomes perhaps and maybe they're not able to escape in the, into the cytoplasm. Uh, if you look at that merged image, we see absolutely zero co-localization between the lysosome and, and, and where these uh, we, where these proteins are. And again, you can see that in the GFP and the lysoview with the bright field image. And so we can certainly say that the GFP is not in lysosomes, at least based on these images. Uh, we've also done some studies with early endosomal MAC markers, and these are also not early endosomes. And so we do believe these are somehow escaping into the cytoplasm, uh, but we wanted some more direct proof of that. And so to see if this can actually function um, inside of a cell, rather than using GFD, which is great, but we're really not interested in, in transfecting just GFD, uh, we decided to use some, some, some proteins that would actually show us cytosolic activity. And so the first test here was to... Um, uh, deliver RNase A. And so RNase A, as its name indicates, uh, is an enzyme that chews up RNAs. And so clearly, if you're chewing up RNAs in your cell, your readout is toxicity. It's essentially cell viability. You should be killing your cells. However, if you just deliver RNase A directly to a cell, just with RNase A, nothing happens. Uh, the reason for that is RNase A can't go into cells, right? Um, and so what we thought was, okay, let's cloak RNase A and then determine if by cloaking it, we can actually deliver it into a cell and then cause cell toxicity uh, or cause cell death, uh, which would be great if you're delivering this to a cancer cell and you want to kill that cancer cell, for example. And so that's what we did. We took RNase A, uh, modified it with our cloak, our reversible cloak, again, showing you the gel that we're able to do this modification. RNase A is a highly basic protein uh, with a PI above 8.5 as shown. Once you modify it with a cloak, we're able to bring that PI all the way down. Again, if we treat it with DTT, a reducing agent, we can recover, we can recover our protein. Uh, also showing you some, some CD studies just showing that uh, RNSA by itself or with the sulfonate cloak or the reverse RNSA all have the same um, um, structural features. And so we're not destroying the structure um, of this protein by modifying with our anionic cloaks. 
And then we tested the activity uh, and we wanted to see if the activity of RNASA was affected by the cloaks. Um, and what we see here is that the activity of RNASA is in fact, to some extent affected by the cloaks. And so going from five to 10 to 15 equivalencies uh, of modification, which is the red to green, to green, we see that the activity of RNASA actually decreases. And so I'm showing you a kinetic activity um, plot. And so this is just the substrate for RNASA. Uh, it's essentially a FREP probe, it's a quencher. Um, and so as RNASA cleaves this probe, it releases fluorescence. And so as we modify, we can see that the activity decreases, but we also see that once we pre-treat the RNASA that is cloaked with the reducing agent, we're able to regain the activity of RNASA, which is what we expect to happen in, in the cytosol. And so if this is actually getting delivered to the cytosol, we expect to have this, this sort of feature. Uh, we can make an equivalent probe to, to actually investigate the effect of the cleavable disulfide bond. And so we make one with a CC bond in the middle that by, by, by at least by reduction is not cleavable. And we see that again, modification with this, with this new cloak also reduces the activity um, even more so than, than the reversible cloak. Um, and once we treat with DTT, we're not able to regain the function again, because um, DTT cannot cleave this, this new non-cleavable system. And so finally we add this to cells. Uh, and this is showing that if you add blank LMPs, like blank lipid nanoparticles, nothing happens to your cell viability, which we knew about. Um, if you add RNAs A um, at the same concentrations, nothing happens uh, to the cell viability. But of course, if you deliver RNAs A cloaked with ASL4 in the lipid nanoparticle, you're able to see um, a clear decrease in cell viability, um, more so with the cleavable probes than with the non-cleavable probes. Again, showing us that we can deliver these into cells and the toxicity we're seeing, the reduction in cell viability is solely a function of the RNAs A that we're delivering into the cells. Interestingly enough, as you go to higher equivalencies, we actually see a reduction in activity that is an increase in cell viability uh, with both the cleavable um, and the non-cleavable probes. Okay, uh, and then finally, what we can do is, yes, cell viability is important. <laughs> as we increase the amount of RNA, say that it's cloaked that we deliver, we can see a reduction in cell viability, the function of concentration. We see it in a variety of, of cancer cell lines, all the way from HELIS, SKBR3, breast cancer cells, colon cancer cells, ovarian cancer cells, lung cancer cells. And so this is pretty universal because again, RNA safe just destroys all the RNAs uh, once it's delivered into these particles. And what was really interesting to us was we plotted the, um, the IC50, which is the inhibitory concentration of the, of the delivered RNAs. And so the lower, the more potent to the EC50, which is the effective concentration of delivery. So again, if we max out delivery at some point, what is the concentration that gets us 50% into our cells, just fluorescence, so just uptake. Uh, and we see actually a really good correlation between uptake essentially, which is what's plotted on the y-axis uh, and cell killing, which is what's plotted or the potency of cell, uh, cell killing, which is what's plotted on the x-axis. And so as you can see, um, our probes get into DLD1 colorectal cancer cells the best, and they kill colorectal cancer cells the best, DLD1 cells, which is what's shown there at about 100 nanomolar, um, all the way to breast cancer cells, which is at the top there at, at about 361 nanomolar. So there's a really good correlation between the ability to actually deliver these, um, these um, cytotoxic proteins into cells and their ability to actually kill cells. Again, telling us that the killing is coming directly from protein. That we're delivering. And then finally, just wanted to show you just a little bit of data that we also have on off-the-shelf antibodies. This is one of the most exciting parts for us, as I mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk, which is, can you simply just grab a protein off the shelf, a commercially available antibody, and just deliver it into cells? These are 150 kilodalton antibodies. Um, doesn't have to be an antibody, it can be an antibody, but, but we wanted to work with antibodies because there are tons of antibodies out there being used by Western blots. They're, they're highly validated against their targets. And so again, in our minds, we're thinking, can we do what we do with small molecules to inhibit certain pathways? And can we do exactly the same thing with antibodies, but without lysing the cell and just delivering the antibodies right into cells? And so that's the idea behind this is, can we take an off-the-shelf antibody, cloak it, essentially just add it to a lipid nanoparticles, deliver it into a cell and see some sort of a functional output. 
And so to do that, we started out with just an isotype IgG that is, it doesn't target anything in particular. We just wanted to see, can we label this with a fluorophore and can you actually see it inside the cell? Um, and that's what, we, what I'm showing you here. We can take antibodies. This is an off the shelf IgG label with Alexa 4488. Um, and then modify it with anywhere from 15 to 60 equivalents of the probe. This is how much we add. Um, the, the, the amount modified on the, the, that is the labeling ratio is really about four to five on the antibodies as well. Um, we typically just, you just add this in buffer, you react for about um, overnight, um, and then you just dialyze the, 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 the cloaks out and that's about it. So really any lab can do this. And we see that even with about, just with about 30 equivalent modification, which gives us a, again, a modification ratio of about four to five on the antibody that we're able to transfect about 70 to 80% uh, of cells. Uh, we see that the antibodies alone, again, obviously don't go into cells. Antibodies alone without the cloak with the LMPs also don't go into cells. That's the graphion at the bottom. But of course, once you cloak the antibody and you add them into the LMPs and deliver them, you can see about 80% of the cells are actually transfected. Um, with a pretty decent concentration, this is about 215 nanomolar. Of, of the antibody that was added to the formulation. Encapsulation efficiency is a little bit lower than GFP, and so that hovers around 50% or so. Okay, so we can cloak them, we can encapsulate them in, into these particles, do they deliver? Um, and they, they do, and so here we picked uh, to look at functional cytosolic activity rather than just looking at fluorescence, which is what I showed you before. Uh, we picked this, uh, this antibody, which is a, it's a, it's a beta-catenin antibody, and we picked beta-catenin because um, essentially no small molecules against beta-catenin have been validated. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is certainly an oncotarget. It's a transcription factor that leads to the production of, production of a whole bunch of oncogenes, and so uh, being able to inhibit beta-catenin is extremely uh, important and clinically relevant. We use what's called a top flash assay to serve as a readout for um, transcriptional inhibition. And, and in short terms, without going into too much detail, um, the top flash assay essentially reports um, luciferous expression as a reporter for uh, transcriptional initiation. And so by using this assay, what we initially wanted to see was, okay, if we take the beta catenin antibody, which we just purchased off the shelf, it has a KD of about 300 nanomolar. And so it's actually not the best antibody, but it, it was what was commercially available. Um, if we modify, do we affect its binding activity? Um, and so this is just doing a simple ELISA on this. And so we can see the beta catenin IgG, uh, we validated it. It does have a, a KD of about 400 nanomolar in our hands or so. Once we modify it with the SL4, which is in light blue, and we treat the modified antibody to reduce it and remove the anionic cloaks off of it, we see that we're not really changing the, um, the KD of the antibody by much. It's really only about twofold, and we're able to recover it once we remove the, the cloak from the antibody. But even more interesting was when we transfect cells uh, with these modified antibody, uh, we actually see functional activity of beta catenin inhibition. And so what you're looking at on the, on the y-axis is a normalized transcriptional readout of luciferous expression. Um, again, um, if you're not inhibiting beta-catenin, this is the wind active cell line, you see high, um, high luciferous expression due to beta-catenin activation. If we deliver um, an IgG that I showed, well, I haven't showed right here. If we deliver an, an isotype IgG that is cloaked into a cell, on the right, we show that we can deliver these into cells. Uh, but again, it's an isotype. It doesn't bind to beta catenin. We see that we have no influence on activity, which is the gray bars uh, in cells. But when we deliver the beta catenin antibody, again, on the right, we can see that we can deliver it just like the isotype. But here, we actually see a response from the antibody because the antibody is inhibiting, inhibiting beta catenin uh, function directly in cells. And so to us, this was really exciting. Uh, this was our first demonstration that we could deliver a functional antibody into cells, and we can see inhibition of, of um, an oncoprotein. And since, since then, we've done this on a variety of antibodies, uh, but we also wanted to be able to translate this in vivo. Uh, and so here, I'm just showing you some M-cherry data. It's fluorescent. It's a red fluorescent protein, and so we can see it in animals. Um, quickly up top there, just showing that we can, we can modify this, we can make it anionic, we can recover it. 
Uh, but we wanted to do a, an LMP screen to understand what the best formulation conditions for this protein would be in vivo since LMPs for direct protein delivery in vivo have just, at least to the best of our knowledge, hadn't been done before. And what we settled on was this 10 weight to weight percent of lipid to protein, 3% PEC and 30% and, and GOTAP gave us the smallest size, or at least a decent size or a good balance between size, which is about 200 nanometers, serum stability, which is close to 70% stable in serum um, over 24 hours. Um, really good transfection of our cells, which is covered around 90% transfection and over 90% cell viability. And so this is the formulation we, we, we moved in vivo. And here we're just showing that M cherry alone, if you just add M cherry to cells of one make the cake, again, it just, you know, just goes right to the kidneys of the animal. Um, you see no distribution in, in any other um, tissues. But with the LMPs, you see that with the LMP formulation, you're able to redirect that formulation to still goes, some of it still goes to the kidneys for sure. Uh, but we're able to redirect some of that formulation to the liver and now to the lungs and to other tissues as well. And that quantification is shown to you um, on the right-hand side as a function of time. So again, showing you that the, the, the encapsulation in the LMP is long-lived enough to redirect these formulations to different tissues in vivo. Uh, but not only do we redirect them, once we section the tissue, I believe this is the lungs in this case, um, you are able to see the M cherry actually within that tissue uh, as shown at the bottom there. Hopefully that's visible on your screen. And so we can, we can do this for m cherry, but we can also do this for IgGs. We can take the same formulation, swap out m cherry, put in IgGs. Um, IgGs naturally will go to the liver in this case, and that's what we see. Uh, but once we cloak them, um, again, primarily due to the dotap in the formulation, we're able to redirect this, for example, uh, to the lungs. Again, showing that we can deliver these full-length proteins, including antibodies, um, in vivo using these formulations. And so we're super excited about this. I'm going to wrap up over here just to keep things short um, in that we've demonstrated the delivery of a wide variety of proteins all the way from something super small like RNase A, but highly cationic with a PI of about 8.5, 8.6 uh, to intermediate proteins like SFGFP and m -cherry. Uh, We're currently working on some ubiquitous bodies with a collaboration with, with Matt DeLisa and our lab. Those are about 50 kilodalton. Uh, but we've done most of our work to date uh, with publications that will soon be coming out have been on IgGs. And so we've done this isotype IgG, like I mentioned, we've done beta catenin. I showed you data on that, uh, but we've also done a whole bunch of the other antibodies listed on here as well. And they've all been, been quite successful. And so, again, we think what this technology allows us to achieve is, is to achieve to be able to deliver a broad spectrum of proteins into cells. Uh, we see biocompatibility both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, we think we should be able to regulate intracellular release, although we haven't done that yet. And so right now we've only stuck to this disulfide bond, but you know, you can imagine we can swap out that disulfide bond with other cleavable functionalities as well for in vivo use. And, and we think again, um, any protein, almost, I say almost, we haven't done any protein, but but really almost any protein in any cell can be delivered with this universal cloaking strategy. And so with that, I wanna thank you guys for listening. Um, I'm happy to be here at Build a Cell. This is my group composition. Some of the collaborators that we work on on this project uh, are funding sources. And I would be super happy to take any questions that folks may have. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. There is a lot of questions in chat. Can you see chat? I can, yes. Could, oh, yes, could you I read can. a question before answering it so it's going to go for the recording? Sure, sure, I will do that. So I'll read a question from Mohammed. This is fascinating work. Does the charge on the protein affect the delivery rates with lipofectamine? Um, the charge on the protein does affect, yes, it does affect the delivery rates. Uh, to the extent that if you use an anionic protein, that if I that is if I take a protein and I run an isoelectric point focusing gel on it, and its PI is about 4.6, you don't actually need the cloak. You can just take that protein, put it into the LMPs, and you'll deliver it directly. And so for, for all of you out there, the cloak is not always necessary. Now, the, the fraction of proteins that have a PI below four is very small. <laughs> and so just a lot of those proteins don't exist, but they do exist. We've seen some, some DARPINs 
that are highly anionic. And yeah, you just put them with LMPs and they go directly into cells. Uh, but for most proteins, again, with most IgGs, pretty much all the IgGs we've tried, they're all around seven or so. So you still have to, you need the cloak to bring them down. But yes, to some extent it will. Um, Kathleen asks, do we know what's the metabolism of those lipids from LMPs? Do they stay, stay embedded in the membrane or do they end in some sort of degradation pathway? Again, a really interesting question. Um, most of the LMP, no, all of the LMPs that we use, uh, are, again, are either the Pfizer formulation or the Moderna formulation, or at least the MC3 ones are, um, if you guys are familiar with the first siRNA drug that was approved in 2019 against TTR amyloidosis, that's where MC3 comes from. So these are all FDA approved lipids. They're all degradable lipids. And so they should all degrade, the head groups degrade their ester bonds in them. Um, and so I would assume they end up as the tails, which will be the lipid portions that embed in the membrane, likely end up as fatty acids somehow. Um, Emmanuel says, very impressive. Thank you for this talk. Thanks, Emmanuel. What's the half-life of the lipid particles in the bloodstream? So with our proteins, we don't know what the half-life is, but I can tell you that within about three days or so, we see complete clearance uh, from the animal. Um, and so we're trying to improve that um, that circulation time. Though I would say, you know, with siRNAs, you're, you're likely looking at the same circulation time as well. So we haven't done half-life calculations, but but over 48 hours to 96 hours, they're completely clear from the bloodstream. So we don't really see them. We just go to the kidneys. I would say usually by 48 hours, they're they're cleared out through the kidneys if they're not if they don't have some extra targeting agent on them or something. And then Mohammed also asks. Could you use the system to deliver simple protein circuits? How simple, small do they need to be? Um, I don't know. We haven't done that. Um, but if by protein circuits you mean a collection of proteins, then likely, yes, we can ionically cloak those proteins and deliver them either all in one particle or deliver them in a range of particles and you can do temporal additions. Um, so I assume so, but, but it's not something we've done, um, how small and simple do they need to be? They can be as small as you want. And so we've done, again, RNSA, we've done 13.7 kilodalton, we've done IgGs that's bigger than 150. What I'm not showing is we've also done peptides that are as small as four kilodalton, and we can also get them into cells. And so they can be as small as you want, essentially. Um, Angela asked how big the LMPs are. Ours are about 200 nanograms, two to 300. Could you deliver nucleic acid binding protein carrying a nucleic acid payload? Yeah, you mean the Cas9 system? Yes, we could. Um, other people have done that. Dan Siegwood has done that already. Um, and so, yes, you can do that with LMPs. In fact, you don't need to cloak them when you do that because the Cas9 is already binding to the RNA. And so the RNA actually serves as the ionic cloak on the Cas9. But but that's been done before. If you look at one of Siegwood's publications, you'll likely, it's, it's buried in the supporting information, but but it's been done before. Um, and then Hagen says, thank you very much. Have you studied the immunogenicity of a delivery system? Is there any IgG against the sulfonate in serum? Wow, that's a really, really good question. I do not know. I do not know. That's an excellent question. Um, now, the sulfonates on the, on, on the proteins are not actually exposed in serum because they're in the particle. So any um, immune immunogenicity will be against the particle. And I would say that is similar to any immune response that you'll see against LMPs that I'm sure 80 to 90% of us have because we've all taken the COVID-19 vaccine. And so I would say for the particles themselves, it was similar to what you see with the vaccines. Um, remember the sulfonates come off in the cell. And so they don't remain on the protein and they only come off in the cytosol. And we don't have free unencapsulated protein, because we dialyze the unencapsulated protein out, by the way, before we go in vivo. Sorry, I forgot to, to mention that, right? And so that won't be there. Um, but the short answer to the question is we don't, we don't know. Um, however, the sulfonate modification is not foreign to the system, right? You have threonine and, and serine sulfonation mechanisms as well. And so these are post translational modifications that the body makes anyways, but just wanted to throw that out there, but I don't, I don't know. We haven't studied it. Um, and then last question was, what is the minimum number of lysine on the protein surface to form LMP and achieve delivery? <laughs> A lot of, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We know that we modify with an average of, of three to four. 
So we need at least three to four lysines uh, is what we've seen from our modifications. But that's of a certain size protein. I would say that's of proteins at least on the order of the RNAs A or bigger, so maybe 15 kilodalt not bigger. When we modify peptides, which I'm not showing here, we only need one, right? And so we've done a peptide of like four kilodalt and, and we only needed one lysine modification and we saw excellent delivery. So I guess it will depend on the size of the protein, but it will also depend on the It'll also depend on the charge of the protein, like I mentioned, you know? So if the protein is already anionic with a PI less than less than 4.5, you don't need any protein. So you don't need any lysines. You can just take that and put that into an LMP and deliver it directly. Those are all the questions I can see. Hopefully I answered everyone's questions to the best of my ability. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm, I'm really interested in um, what Mohammed was asking. Um, about delivering of um, kind of a more complex circuits and I'm really looking forward to seeing. Yeah, more. so I mean, we haven't done that, but because um, I'm not a protein circuit guy, but I'd be really interested in folks have protein circuits that they want to deliver. Again, if it's just an array of proteins or you want to change the stoic geometry, I would be happy to try it out. Um, you know, where we're pretty confident in the ability of these things to deliver these proteins. now. With every technology, there's a limitation. And so I don't want to, I'm careful not to say this would work on all proteins. I would, but I'm confident to say it would work on all antibodies because we've tried over seven different ones, eight different, it, it always works. Things where, you know, I always think it's good to say, okay, where would this be challenging? I think this would be challenging based on the stability of a protein. I think if we, you know, we've done IgGs, which are relatively rock solid proteins. You have a FC crystallizable regions. We've done GFP, that's a pretty rock solid protein. RNA say, okay, maybe that's a flimsy one, but but not too awful. But but I can imagine some proteins with a low TDM that are not stable will likely may not survive this formulation condition. And so I think it'll all depend on the stability of the protein um, that we're modifying. Also, I imagine proteins with a cysteine active site as an enzyme might also not work because again, they might just attack the disulfide. So there are limitations there. It's not going to work for every single protein, but, but if you have an antibody, I can almost guarantee it will work. Yeah, this is really cool. Um, oh, Mohammed has a follow-up question. Could you deliver a ribosome? That's an interesting one. <laughs> um, um, I, that's a big one. So I don't know. I uh, that will likely be challenging. Um, yeah, that's all I would say. I would say that would be difficult. But but interesting to try. Um, if if someone can give us a a, a ribosome protein to deliver, sure. But I I think that would likely be quite quite difficult. I can imagine it would be really challenging, but also really powerful. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I actually have a follow-up question. I, I don't know if I if 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 I missed it when you were talking about it. You were mostly talking about the biomedical applications, so mammalian cells. Can you deliver to something else? Like, can you deliver to yeast? Hmm. Um. Because Mohammed's question made me think about it, because that could be like a bio bioengineering bioproduction tool. Interesting. Um, I don't know. Now, I would say we can deliver anywhere that LMPs have been shown to deliver. How about that? That's the best I can yeah. answer that. And so I don't, I don't recall if LMPs have been used to deliver things into yeast. Um, mm -hmm. But all, remember, all we're doing is we're just hijacking a natural delivery system of LMPs. Yeah. And so if, if there's a publication that shows that LMPs have been used to deliver RNAs to yeast, for example, then I would say I would put my money on it and say yes. Maybe. So I'd have to look at the literature and, and see if that's been done. That's cool. That's really cool. Thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, I want to say thank you, Chris, again, very much for the seminar. And thanks, everyone else. And have a great rest of your Monday. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Bye. Take care, everybody.